welcome everyone to our Sunday service and uh, we'll begin with singing the song Eternal Wisdom, Timely Friend. Eternal Wisdom, Timely Friend. It's number eight in your songbook, Open Wide the Church's Door. Jesus Christ, so that we may hold fast in times of trial, even to the end of the ages. Amen. Let us be seated as we open our hearts to receive the word and the wisdom coming to us in the receiving of Holy Scripture.
A reading from the first book of Samuel. On the day when Elkanah sacrificed, he would give portions to his wife, Penina, and to all her sons and daughters. But to Hannah, he gave a double portion, because he loved her, though the Lord had closed her womb. Her arrival used to provoke her severely, to irritate her, because the Lord had closed her womb. So it went on year by year. As often as she went up to the house of the Lord, she used to provoke her. Therefore Hannah wept and would not eat. Her husband Elkanah said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why do you not eat? Why is your heart sad? Am I not more to you than ten sons? After they had eaten and drunk at Shiloh, Hannah rose and presented herself before the Lord. Now Eli the priest was sitting on the seat beside the doorpost of the temple of the Lord. She was deeply distressed and prayed to the Lord and wept bitterly. She made this vow. O Lord of hosts, if only you will look on the misery of your servant and remember me, and not forget your servant, but will give to your servant a male child, then I will set him before you as a Nazareth until the day of his death. He shall drink neither wine nor intoxicants, and no razor shall touch his head. As she continued praying before the Lord, Eli observed her mouth. Hannah was praying silently. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she was drunk. So Eli said to her, How long will you make a drunken spectacle of yourself? Put away your wine. But Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman deeply troubled. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I have been pouring out my soul before the Lord. Do not regard your servant as a worthless woman, for I have been speaking out of my great anxiety and vexation all this time. And Eli answered, Go in peace. The God of Israel grant the petition you have made to him. And she said, Let your servant find favor in your sight. Then the woman went to her quarters, ate and drank with her husband, and her countenance was sad no longer. They rose early in the morning and worshipped before the Lord, then they went back to their house at Ramah. Elkanah knew his wife Hannah, and the Lord remembered her. In due time, Hannah conceived and bore a son. She named him Samuel, for she said, I have asked him of the Lord. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the gathering. Thanks Thanks. be to God. In response to Hannah's wonderful gift of a child, she bursts forth into song. In the song we know as Hannah's song, Uh, which is replicated by Mary in the birthing of Jesus in what we call the Magnificat. We're going to sing a version of that, hymn number 363 in your hymn book, Hannah's Song and Mary's Song number 363. My soul proclaims your glory, Lord.
Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. As Jesus was coming out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what large stones and what huge buildings. Then Jesus asked him, Do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. All will be thrown down. When he was sitting on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will all this be? And, and what will be the sign that all these things are about to be accomplished? Then Jesus began to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am the one. And they will lead many people astray. When you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place, but the end is still to come. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom there will be earthquakes. In various places there will be famines. This is but the beginning of the birth. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. We join in small numbers here and in numbers in cyberspace who tune in to our broadcast and recording today. And we join in a time of Hannah's anxiety and vexation of spirit, because the thing she most wants in life is denied to her, and that is the gift of life itself that she should bring into the world the next generation and be part of that great unbroken chain of generation to generation to generation that has been part not only of our faith but of all of the human race since time immemorial in all of our evolution. And in Jesus we come across a time of great global cataclysm where the temple itself is on the line, so to speak. That the one great symbol and most magnific magnificent building in all of the experience of these little Galilean fishermen coming up, perhaps in some case for the first time, to see this fantastic edifice in front of them, are then placed with the question of what it would be like if all of this simply ceased to exist. In our world today we are going through micro changes and macro changes of unspeakable proportions. At the very small level of our little Anglican Church of Canada we are seeing buildings closing down along with all other forms of denomination and other forms of community and faith, that places are shrinking, that membership is declining, and that buildings are being closed. At the personal level, we may see what Hannah experienced, but for very different reasons. There are particular lines of scientific inquiry that study human fertility in today's world. And for reasons, perhaps, of the change in our environment and the pollution of our environment, it seems that more and more 
the natural way in which conception and birth occurs is becoming less and less common. Not just because people are having smaller families, but because, in fact, there is a question that hangs over our ability both to impregnate and to conceive and to give birth. And some of the dire scientific experts who study these things imagine that within our lifetime or within the lifetime of our children, we will see a time when it will be the exception rather than the norm that people will be able to give birth by natural means. And so like Hannah's experience, but for very different reasons, we and others may have personal and existential crises. Those who grew up in large families are seeing that their children no longer either get married or have children. <laughs> <laughs> and we wonder about our future. Of course, these same children are going through the great mega questions of our time about the sustainability of our planet and what it is that we who are in our retirement or golden or whatever years you want to call us, uh, for those of us who are the majority of the people that fill up pews and seats in churches these days, what is it that we are in fact leaving to our children and grandchildren in this world of accelerated heat and apparent emergencies, indeed felt and experienced emergencies? Of course, for Hannah, and through her long journey of pain and grieving and her husband thinking she was drunk when she was actually just in desperate agony of soul. There was a solution. She did in fact conceive and gave birth to a son. And it's that very concept of birth pangs that is Jesus' primary metaphor for dealing with the crises of his day and indeed the crises of all the disciples of all generations. And so for those of us who live with fearful hearts, and sometimes we do, as we wonder and ponder around us at the levels of distress, is the universe winding up or winding down? You know, at the existential level, if we're 14 billion years into this magnificent explosion of life that we call the universe and it were to all collapse back in in another 14 billion years, we probably wouldn't lose much sleep over that tonight. Is that fair to say? <laughs> because 14 billion years just seems a little bit too far for us to lose any sleep or concern over. But we might be losing sleep over more urgent concerns that affect our families and ourselves more precisely. Whether they be economic, is the human race really evolving into this wonderful skill and wisdom founded on all of the generations of skill and wisdom and standing on the shoulders of gone, those who've gone before us? Or are we in fact fracturing into this desperate division where we seem to live in more small-minded ways rather than in more broad-hearted ways, where compassion gives way to selfishness so often time and time again, and wealth accumulates into tiny pockets that create imperial patterns just in exactly the same way as Jesus experienced it, that the Herods and the Caesars of his day could make absolute misery of the other 99% of the population's lives. And so we live with questions of justice, questions of sustainability, practical questions of daily life, that affect us. And Jesus gives us this astonishing image of birth pangs to counsel for us a hope and a joy of what lies at the end, beyond all of our sufferings. 
not in any way to diminish or demean the reality of that suffering and who am I, I have never birthed a child, but for those of you who have, who am I to say how much that pain really is? And yet Jesus presents to us the, the Hannah image of long waiting painfully, pouring out our souls in grief. We are in the right place. We've come not only to sing our joy like Hannah, but to pour out our pain in prayer and to take of the brokenness of our daily lives at this altar in bread and in wine. So that we too might be broken open for the life of the world as Jesus was. And so we are counseled and advised not to jump on quick solutions, not to look for simple messiahs, not to look for answers that can all be met within the next five-year plan or governmental term of office, or anything that we think that we could vote in that would solve the world's problems. But to look beyond that, and to look bigger, into the biggest possible picture that Jesus calls the Kingdom of God. In one translation I read recently, the First Nations version of Scripture, the a uh, translator of that comes up with the term, the good road, that Jesus preached the good road, that this path, this spirit path, in which we practice love and compassion and generosity and live beyond our small selves into our biggest self and into our deepest and truest consciousness, our identity in God, not in our own small selfish preoccupation was something that Jesus looked forward to with a sense of certainty that was in no way a denial of the present suffering which we all need to go through. Both collectively we share in the pain of our planet and individually we go on our own little pathway with all of our illnesses and weaknesses and limitations and the knowledge that one day we too will be gathered to our ancestors. Yet we do it with patience. We do it with hope. We do it with expectation that there is a greater than what we can see with our eyes that there is a deeper pattern at work in this evolving universe, that the Spirit of God is bringing a good road into being among humans, that there is and will be an end that is greater than all of our middle. We have a beginning in joy and beauty, and we have an ending to look forward to in joy and beauty, and yet we must, in this in-between space, live with faithfulness, with hope, with love, and with compassion. In this world of apocalyptic change and deep distress, let us keep our souls in patience. Let us continue to faithfully pray to live, to serve, to work, to do our part, and to keep on opening our hearts to a better world than the one we have now. Amen.
moment of quietness, I invite you to lift up your hearts in prayer and in that space to bring into your heart and the forefront of your consciousness those people, places, and situations for whom you would pray this day. Let us remember all who lead and guide us within the church and within our wider society. Let us pray for our own commitment and participation in the common good, for the implementation of the COP26 common agreements, and for our own commitment to a sustainable world. Let us pray for our pathway of reconciliation with the First Nations of this country and this continent and for our commitment to a world of peace and justice for all whom we elect or appoint to lead and guide us, that they may participate in a spirit of wisdom and a search for the common good. I invite you to stand as you're comfortable and Harry will lead us in a litany the response to the bidding, God of love and compassion, is, hear our prayer. community, our province, and our country, that you will help us cherish the, the common good, God of love and compassion, hear our prayer, for the whole human family, that we may live together with peace, justice, and respect for one another, God of love and compassion, hear our prayer, for the people of God, here and in every place, that each one of us may be a true and faithful servant, God of love and compassion, hear our prayer, for the witness and mission of the church in all the world, that the good news of Jesus Christ may fill all the earth, God of love and compassion, hear our prayer, for those in special needs, for the poor and the hungry, for the weak and for the sick, for the lonely and the mistreated, for the grieving and for the dying, that you will comfort and be near them. God of love and compassion, hear our prayer. For our daily lives, and for all that we do and say and think, for the wrong we do and for the good we leave undone, that you will release us from sin and renew us, God of love and compassion, hear our prayer. We have the assurance that God hears our prayers, forgives our sins, restores and renews us to right relationship. Let us therefore celebrate with a sign of peace God's goodness to us. The peace of God be always with you. I invite you standing in place to simply turn to those around you and give a nod or a bow of greeting and peace.
we'll uh, set the table in quietness and we'll follow Eucharistic prayer number two on page 17. Eucharistic prayer number two on page 17 in your great book. Him will sing at number 503 in your hymn book, Fight the Good Fight with All Your Might. In 503, Fight the Good Fight. Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
Eternal God, source of all being, we give you thanks and praise for your faithful love. You call us into friendship with you and one another to be your holy people, a sign of your presence in the world. When those we trust betray us, unfailingly you remain with us. When we injure others, you confront us in your love and call us to the paths of righteousness. You stand with the weak and those broken and alone, whom you have always welcomed home, making the first last and the last first. Therefore we raise our voices with angels and archangels as we say together, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, Holy One. When Hagar was driven into the wilderness, you followed her and gave her hope. When Joseph was sold into bondage, you turned malice to your people's good. When you called Israel out of slavery, you brought them through the wilderness into the promised land. When your people were taken into exile, you wept with them by the river of Babylon and carried them home. Restore us, O God, let your face shine. At the right time you sent your anointed one to stand with the poor, the outcast, and the oppressed. Jesus touched lepers and the sick and healed them. He accepted water from a woman of Samaria and offered her the water of new life. Christ knew the desolation of the cross and opened the way for all humanity into the redemption of your reconciling love. On the night he was betrayed, Jesus at supper with his friends took bread, gave you thanks, broke the bread, gave it to them and said, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper he took the cup of wine and when he had given thanks he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Loving and Holy One, recalling Christ's death and resurrection, we offer you these gifts. Longing for the bread of tomorrow and the wine of the age to come, therefore we proclaim our hope. Dying, you destroyed our death. Rising, you restored our life. Lord Jesus, come in glory. Pour out your Spirit on these gifts, that through them you may sustain us in our hunger for your peace. We hold before you all whose lives are marked by suffering, our sisters and brothers. When we are broken and cast aside, embrace us in your love. Restore us, O God, let your face shine. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory are yours, O source of all life, now and forever. Amen. As our Savior taught us, we say in prayer, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Sentence 2 on page 24. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We, being many, are one body, for we all share in the one bread. The gifts of God for us, the beloved of God. 
Thanks be to God. together in the prayer at the bottom of page 26, our post-communion prayer. All your works praise you, O Lord, and your faithful servants bless you. Gracious God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. May we who share his body live his risen life. We who drink his cup bring life to others. We whom the Spirit lights give light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope you have set before us, 
so that we and all your children shall be free, and the whole earth live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Now may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, Creator, Sustainer, and Redeemer, be with you now and always. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 506, number 506, Lord of all hopefulness.